Well, here we are. We're discussing the lesson I call Digestion 4. And this is a fourth lesson in digestion. And just like Digestion 3, I've picked out some disorders, some things that go wrong with the digestive tract of our companion animals. And sometimes I pick out things either I've experienced with my animals directly or know somebody that had experienced it and they relayed some information to me. Of course, I never offer any medical advice. I'm just giving examples of disorders. And if you have companion animals, you need to find a very skilled veterinarian to help you with their life and health. So that's nothing new, is it? You need some help. We all need help. I'm going to talk about canine bloat. I had a friend's dog die of this. I think they had never heard of canine bloat. And when they called me, I said, gee, that sounds like bloat. And it ends up being that the dog did die of bloat. And it was a big mastiff dog. Very pretty dog. Now, I say canine bloat because you've got to be careful. Because if you deal with cattle, cattle have bloat. But it's in the digestive tract, but a different part. And... Um, they have some similar similarities, but since we're doing companion animals, we're doing canine bloat. Now, here's another name. Remember, I always try to give you multiple names. Uh, gastric dilatation vulvalis. Maybe we can digest that word. Oop, digest. That's not a pun, actually. Digest this whole <laughs> disorder. Gastric. You remember that always refers to stomach. Dilatation, that means kind of a widening, uh, enlarging. And this vulvalis is really hard to figure out. I wish they would have said torsion because that's what it really means, a twisting. So I guess I would have liked to seen it called gastric dilatation torsion. But usually when you look it up, this is how it's designated. Okay, well, let's talk about it. I've got this nice diagram here that somebody has made. I'm going to enlarge it and then just orientate you to it. Again, anytime you need more time to look at figures, you have the pause button, right? Anyway, to orientate you, the esophagus, right? Coming, uh, bringing food from the mouth down the esophagus by peristalsis. Here's the normal size stomach in this drawing. And then you know the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. Well, here's the sequence of events. Gas and fluid. And maybe it's more gas than anything, I think. But this diagram shows gas and fluid cause dilatation and possible torsion. And they're going to show you that this arrow means torsion that way, twisting. Um, obviously, the stomach is enlarging from the figure on the left. And then if this contents cannot escape, it ends up further expanding. And once it twists, it messes up blood supply. Now, I found a very good table. There's many of these out there. But I found this great table that shows you the sequence of events. And I'm going to let you pause and read it and study it because I'm, it's a waste of time for me to do that. But over here it tells maybe things that are contributing factors like stress, excitement, you can read it. And then down here it's phases. What happens first? Basically the phases are up here. This is the first thing that happens. Then the second. Then the third phase. And then finally death. What is happening? What, what the dog does? talking about the behavior, what you should do, it's very important, and then treatment, of course. Uh, maybe initially there's, you know, something you can do, but otherwise it's a veterinary emergency. And I like how on this table they've got a spot for your veterinarian's number because this is a deadly disorder, canine bloat. Now, I wanted to show you for canine bloat, some radiographs that were taken. 
Remember, I'm big into images and multiple images, because I believe if you look at multiple images of the same thing, you learn more than looking at maybe one image. So let's start. Okay, I'm going to enlarge these and then go on. Well, anyway, you know this is cranial. This is caudal. So the diaphragm must be right in here, right? Because the lungs, heart, sternum. That's like the chest area where the ribs meet on the ventral aspect of the animal. But you can kind of see, man, this is enlarged um, with gas. And the thing is, too bad we don't have like the normal size of this dog's stomach before bloat, but you hardly ever have, you know, like before bloat and then after bloat, right? So trust me, that's enlarged. Another diagram, or radiograph, I should say. Okay, here they've done a nice job of labeling the pylorus. You know, that's the pyloric valve. And then the duodenum here. But they have this big stomach that's abnormal. And sometimes it looks like two different compartments, but this is the stomach. Very good, nice radiograph. And then finally, in the radiographs, here's another one. It doesn't add that much, I guess. But the point is, big stomach. This is caudal. This is cranial. Of course, this is dorsal. And this is ventral. The other thing I wanted to add is, you know, we always are trying to get terms. If you don't know the language, then when you read about things, then maybe you don't understand them. So I'm big on terms. Here's a term. Prophylactic gastropexy. What is this? Do you know this is a treatment that's done for some dogs to prevent canine bloat? So let's look at it. Prophylactic is a term that means like the prevention. And then gastro, you always know that means stomach. And pexy might be new to you, but that means like suturing it in place, tying it down. So if a dog undergoes prophylactic gastropexy, that would be something the owner chooses to do without bloat occurring. This is not like a treatment for bloat. This is a prevention for bloat. So a good veterinarian surgeon would go in there and tack down the stomach to the body wall. I'm not sure exactly how they do it. I know the definition. But they would tack the stomach to the body wall such that it would not twist even when it enlarges because enlarging isn't quite as dangerous as the twisting twisting then occludes blood vessels and it gets very messy okay now we're going to do another digestive disorder you know i've just kind of picked out some ones that i know about or i've heard about or had friends that had it anyway pancreatitis digest the word Whenever you see itis, that means the inflammation of, and then pancreas, that's referring pancre, that's the pancreas. So inflammation of the pancreas. Got a nice little diagram to remind you where the pancreas is. Somebody that's much more talented than me did this. And so over here on the left, the pancreas is always in the first loop of small intestine. Okay, so this is kind of showing you over here the in situ location of the pancreas. Then if we isolate the stomach and the pancreas, here's the stomach and here's the normal pancreas. And I've got like a picture of a real pancreas to show you it shouldn't look irritated. It looks kind of like fat there. And in fact, if you ever dissect an animal in a biology class or something, make sure Either you find the pancreas or have the instructor point out the pancreas because it's easily missed, missed because it can be misinterpreted as fat unless you're really dissecting well and so forth. Anyway, the normal pancreas is actually rather blasé looking. But then look at over here. We have an inflamed pancreas and sometimes it gets hemorrhagic and it gets bumpy and it gets ugly. That is pancreatitis. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a couple images. They were rather small. I'm going to blow them up. They might get a little fuzzy, 
but I'm trying to show here from this image that the pancreas is normally pretty blasé looking. Look at, see all these little areas here are pancreas. You could easily mistake it for fat. This must be a picture taken during surgery. I see some retractors over here. Here is some fat in the abdominal cavity. It's probably the omentum, which uh, we haven't really talked about, about, but it's very interesting tissue. And then here's the intestine there. If you ever observe one of these surgeries or do one when you get trained to do one, of course, then you'll notice that the intestines are always moving. So that's the normal pancreas. I'm going to leave that there and bring in an abnormal pancreas side by side. I don't think it's going to be any issue here about understanding that this pancreas is irritated. Here's an intestine. It's not the same animal and it's a little bit different magnification. But anyway, here's an ugly pancreas. It's got some hemorrhagic sites, very bumpy. And uh, I had a not a friend, but a, somebody that walked up to me when I was walking my Newfoundlands and said, oh, can I pet your dogs? I miss mine. And I go, what happened? Well, she said that her dog, and it wasn't that big a one, uh, had licked the grease off the bottom of the barbecue grill. And unbeknownst to her, it had consumed quite a bit. It wasn't that big a dog, so it doesn't take that much, really. And her dog had died and she had taken it to the her veterinarian of course and then he had diagnosed pancreatitis probably did a necropsy of sorts so I'm not sure if I've used that term before here it is at the bottom of the screen I think I have but I'll define it again necropsy this is where you examine an animal's body to try to determine the cause of death in the human medicine area you would call it an autopsy but when we do it on animals, it's called a necropsy. Okay, so this image on the right, if you were doing a necropsy on an animal that had died, you would go, that's pancreatitis. Okay, so, so I want to end here giving credit to where the illustrations are found. Thank you so much.